Good afternoon. Your Eminences, Reverend Fathers, Your Eminences, Reverend Fathers, distinguished audience, beloved students, good afternoon. So we reach now the third session of our conference entitled Relations with Other Peoples. We have three distinguished scholars, speakers, who will enrich our conference by their contributions. The first one is Associate Professor of Liturgical Studies, the very Reverend Father Chrysostomos Nasis of the Faculty of Theology of the Aristotle University of Thessaloniki, and the visiting professor at our St. John of Damascus Institute of Theology in Balamant. Father Nassis is, well, I cannot say a friend of Balamant. He's one of the Balamant's community, one of our family one of us, so I cannot welcome him in his house. The title of his presentation is A View from Without, the Church of Antioch through the eyes of 17th century Anglican divines. Father Chrysostomos, the floor is yours. Thank you, Reverend President. Chairman of the session for the introduction of the session. I do feel at home here. It's, it's a fact. Reverend hierarchs, dear fathers, learned colleagues, guests, students, brothers and sisters in Christ. I stand before you today with a profound sense of honor as we gather to explore the rich tapestry of history, theology, theogonia, and culture that binds the Orthodox Church of Antioch from its storied past to its vibrant present, with a particular emphasis on the period between the 15th and the 18th centuries. In our aspiration to achieve a proper understanding of history, this conference serves as a beacon illuminating our collective quest for a deeper comprehension of the historical and theological nuances within this venerable ecclesiastical tradition at a critical period. At the same time, I stand before you with an equally profound sense of trepidation. We come together under his Beatitudes high patronage to explore the rich heritage of his throne and its significance in the annals of church history. However, I cannot ignore the grief and devastation brought about by the current events in the surrounding region, events that literally forced many of our colleagues to participate in our conference remotely. We are extremely thankful for 
the patriarchal blessing of his beatitude in this age of adversity, his paternal love in this day of division and his gracious hospitality during this time of hostility. And we ask humbly that through his prayers and through all of our prayers, God's peace may reign supreme throughout the world and in our beloved Orthodox Church. My presentation topic, A View From Without, the Church of Antioch through the eyes of 17th century Anglican divines provides a unique perspective on the interaction between East and West during a complex period in Christian history. The 17th century was marked by an age of exploration, not only of the uncharted territories of the world, but also of theological inquiry and cross-cultural engagement. At the height of the British Empire's overseas expeditions, Anglican theologians expanded their intellectual horizons and turned their gaze towards the ancient seas of the Christian East. Their observations, though gained from a distant vantage point, both theologically and geographically, offer a unique and invaluable perspective that sheds light on the religious landscape of their time. They also provide us with a lens through which we can reflect on the dynamics of inter-Christian dialogue and the intricacies of theological discourse. My research is predicated on the examination of historical details regarding Antiochian Christianity as documented in the writings of 17th century Anglican divines. And specifically today, I will speak about Ephraim or Ephraim, but we're used to Ephraim Paget, who, was, who lived from 17, 1575 approximately to 1647. As we commence, it is essential to provide a concise overview of the historical backdrop of the period in question, which spans virtually the entire Stuart area, er, era. We must therefore take particular note of the developments related to the formation of the Levant Company abroad, as well as the religious disputes back in England. The Levant Company, established in the late 16th century, served as a pivotal, pivotal catalyst in facilitating commerce and fostering diplomatic relations between England and the Eastern lands. This company focused primarily on trade with the Ottoman Empire and its territories in the Eastern Mediterranean, which encompassed parts of modern day Turkey, Syria, and Lebanon. Through their interactions, English travelers, merchants, and diplomats were exposed to the vibrant and diverse Christian communities that had flourished in the shadow of the Ottoman Empire for centuries. The Levant Company's activities were instrumental in creating a, a gateway for cultural and intellectual exchange between England and the Christian East. This exposure sparked the curiosity of 17th century Anglican divines without, about the ancient Christian traditions of the Orient, including those of the Eastern Orthodox and Oriental Orthodox churches. These scholars developed a growing fascination with the doctrinal orthodoxy and liturgical practices of these Eastern Christian communities, which they regarded as potential sources for gaining insight into their own religious and theological debates. We must keep in mind that this was a period of political turmoil and religious reform in England, marked by a growing animosity toward the Church of Rome. At the same time, a notable trend emerged among English theologians affiliated with the established church. Many erudite churchmen, proficient in the languages of Greek and Latin, cultivated a deeper admiration for the Greek fathers and the liturgical practices of the Eastern Orthodox Church. This newfound appreciation was not solely uh, an academic pursuit, rather, it can be attributed in part to their desire to purify the Church of England from what they perceived as popish elements, being inspired by a church that also refused to acknowledge the supreme, full, immediate, and universal ordinary jurisdiction of the Pope of Rome. This trend, of course, reached its peak with the rising influence of Puritanism. 
Anglican theologians also reached out to figures like the ecumenical patriarch Cyril Lucaris, whose theological proclivities seemingly aligned with the Reformed and Protestant principles gaining ground within the Church of England. This was especially noticeable among prominent proponents of Arminianism, a theological movement that rejected the Calvinist doctrine of predestination, as well as Laudianism, a broader church reform movement championed by the Archbishop of Canterbury, William Laud and his supporters. Ephraim Paget, the incumbent at the Church of St. Edmund the King and Martyr, Lombard Street, London, was one such admirer of Laud. Paget was a scholar, royalist, and churchman. From a very young age, he displayed an exceptional aptitude for acquiring and mastering various languages. By way of example, I mentioned that in 1586, the London publisher Robert Waldgrave released an exposition of the Book of Ruth in 28 sermons by the Swiss Reformed theologian Ludwig Lavater, alongside a hymn translated from the Latin into English by the 11-year-old Paget. Educated later at Christ Church, Oxford, by the age of 26, Paget was proficient in some 15 to 16 languages. Paget published his first original theological treatise in 1635. This work titled Christianography, or the description of the multitude of sundry sorts of Christians in the world not subject to the Pope with their unity and how they agree with us in the principal points of difference between us and the Church of Rome was dedicated to the Ar Armenian Bishop of Eli, Francis White. In the dedicatory epistle addressed to Francis, Paget places his work within the broader debates between Anglicans and Roman Catholics. He notes that instead of simply listing names, referring to the challenge posed by Roman Catholics about apostolic succession among Anglicans, he aims to present a list of Christian churches. These churches, he said, have a plethora of adherents, and bear witness to the truth professed by Anglicans in matters of doctrinal and disciplinary controversy with the Roman church. Foremost among them is the Greek church, in quotes, known for its consistent apostolic succession in contrast to the Roman church, which has witnessed multiple schisms throughout its complex history. The Greek church, as Paget notes, has four major patriarchs, those in Constantinople, Alexandria, Antioch, and Jerusalem. Additionally, there are the Muscovite or Russian Christians who inhabit vast territories in Europe and Asia, surpassing the size of the Roman church in Europe. Then there are the Georgians or Iberians and the Bulgarians. Specifically regarding Asia, or what today we would term the Middle East, Paget mentions several Eastern Christian groups, including those in Palestine under the Patriarch of Jerusalem, and the Syrians, also known as Melkites, under the Patriarch of Antioch. These diverse Christian communities and their presence in various regions are essential components of the religious landscape Paget explores in his work. Paget explains that the Christians under the Patriarch of Antioch are referred to as Syrians, not in the ethnic sense, but named after the region of their primary residence. They are also known as Melkites because their bishops traditionally followed the example and authority of the emperors of Constantinople in matters of faith and councils. He also observes that the Patriarch of Antioch, who resides in Damascus, oversees 15 provinces, which include areas in Syria, Beirut, Tripoli, Aleppo, and other regions in Asia, where they live alongside Muslims. The Syrians consider themselves among the most ancient Christians in the world, asserting this status because St. Peter held his seat in Antioch for seven years before he journeyed to Rome. 
This historical claim contributed to their resistance to submission to the Church of Rome. Paget reiterates some of these principal details in later sections of his Christianography, wherein he proceeds to delineate the religious customs observed by the Melkite Christians, the Syrians who fall under the authority of the Patriarch of Antioch. He highlights that they partake in the Eucharist in both forms, that is bread and wine. They believe that the souls of the righteous are in paradise and the wicked are in hell. Their priests are allowed to marry. Their patriarch is chosen by the archbishops or bishops under his authority. They closely follow the customs and traditions of the Greek Orthodox Church in their religious services. They consider those from the Latin tradition to be excommunicated individuals. Quote, all of these Christians before named are of the same communion and an effect of the same religion with the Grecians. A few years after the publication of the second expanded edition of Christianography in 1636, Paget undertook a mission to reaffirm the research findings on the above mentioned topics and other theological issues of concern. To achieve this, he chose to establish direct correspondence with Eastern prelates following the example of others such as William Laud. His correspondence, which was sent around April, May, 1638, was specifically addressed to the patriarchs of Constantinople, Alexandria, Antioch, and Jerusalem, including a circular letter to those four patriarchs combined and individual letters to each. He also wrote a letter to the patriarch in Moscow, whom he calls Archbishop. He also corresponded with the Maronite and the Ethiopian prelate and prominent Protestant figures in Poland and Transylvania. Copies of these letters in Greek, Latin, English, and Syriac, accordingly, are preserved in the British Manuscript Library Manuscript Harley 825. Along with his letters, Paget sent copies of his Christianography and a Greek translation of the Anglican prayer book by Elias Pedley, published in early 1638. In the case of his correspondence with Cyril of Constantinople, Paget also sent a copy of the conferences that took place on May 24 to 26, 1622, involving discussions between King James I, Bishop Francis White of Eli, Archbishop William Laud on the one side, and John Percy, also known as John Fisher, who was a Jesuit on the other side. These are called the conferences with John Fisher. Paget directed his individual letter to the Patriarch of Antioch, who bore the name Athanasius. It is likely that the Patriarch in question was Athanasius II, Dabas, who held office from 1611 to 1619. However, unbeknownst to Paget, at the time he sent the letter, Ephthemius III of Chios was the Patriarch of Antioch, holding this office from 1635 to 1647. The letter begins with the usual formalities in addressing a patriarch. It then proceeds to include a passage about the city of Antioch from St. John Chrysostom's third homily on the statutes to the people of Antioch, as well as a translation of an excerpt, a Greek translation of an excerpt from the Latin version of the English history spanning from 1235 to 1273, authored by Matthew Paris a prominent English historian of the 13th century. I have transcribed the letter for you in the handout, so you may uh, read it when you go back home, and you could see the, the, the quotations from St. John Christ Chrysostom and Matthew Paris. I have also included a, in an English translation of the section of Matthew Paris's English history, under the subheading, the Archbishop of Antioch claims superiority over the Roman pontiff. The passage from Chrysostom underscores Antioch's special importance, emphasizing the virtue of the city's ancestors and its contemporary inhabitants. 
It likens Antioch's early adoption of the Christian faith to a remarkable diadem and draws a parallel to the role of Peter as the first apostle to preach Christ in the city. The text taken from English history is of particular interest. According to the chronicle of events documented by Matthew Paris in 1238, an unnamed patriarch of Antioch with the support of Patriarch Germanos of Constantinople, 1222 to 1240, excommunicated the Pope along with the entire Roman church and court, proclaiming that the church of Antioch held a superior position over Rome. This was the argument of the supposed Patriarch of Antioch at the time. The Antiochian Patriarch argued that St. Peter, who had ruled the Church of Antioch with great honor for seven years and had been treated with reverence in the city, had a deeper connection to Antioch vis-a-vis -vis Rome, where he was reviled, beaten, and eventually martyred. Thus, says the Patriarch of Antioch, the power to bind and loose should be bestowed upon the Greek church rather than the Roman church, which he accused of various sins, including simony, usury, and avarice. This is a unique account of an event that I have not yet been able to corroborate through Greek sources. There is no reason to doubt its veracity a priori, but it must be verified further. If it is true, it seems plausible that the unnamed Antiochian prelate in question refers to the Rotheos I, who held the position of Greek Orthodox Patriarch of Antioch from 1219 to 1245. Our knowledge of him is quite limited. However, historical records indicate that he never resided in his see as he remained in exile, a circumstance directly attributed to the presence of Latin principalities and a Latin Patriarch in Antioch. This may indeed have contributed to Dorothy's presumed anti-Latin sentiments. The letter proceeds to present a sequence of 15 questions encompassing a range of topics from sacramental and doctrinal matters to canonical issues. These inquiries are all linked to what Paget perceives as errors within the Latin tradition. The letter concludes by mentioning the dispatch of Christianography and a Greek translation, as we mentioned, of the Book of Common Prayer, followed by Page's closing remarks and his signature. It remains uncertain whether Patriarch Ephemius III of Antioch received the letter or if he had ever provided a response. Of course, Paget would be able to take recourse to the network of um, connections that were established in the Levant Company. The probability of Paget receiving a response before 1640 is indeed quite remote, considering there's no mention of it in the third, more comprehensive edition of his Christianography published in that year. Had he received the response, Paget would almost certainly have integrated that information into his new version of his text. That is, if he would be satisfied with the response, which is not entirely certain given the that the Roman Catholic given the Roman Catholic proclivities of 17th century Antioch in certain quarters. Without a response in hand, he decided simply to incorporate in his publication an English translation of the aforementioned pa passage from Matthew Paris's English history, thus making this historical account and its underlying rationale available to a wider public. In addressing Ephraim Paget and his historical contributions, it becomes clear that he was a highly educated and devoted Anglican churchman. His strong anti-Catholic stance is a defining characteristic of his scholarly pursuits, and it heightened his sensitivity to the other Petrine Sea, specifically that of Antioch. His dedication to thorough research is evident in the approach he adopted as seen is a letter to the patriarch, which was aimed at acquiring more information on the theological and historical matters that preoccupied him. Notably, Paget integrated a significant passage from Matthew Paris's English history into his correspondence, underlying the meticulousness and diligence of his scholarship. However, 
it is crucial to contextualize Paget's work within the specific historical backdrop of 17th century England that shaped his perspective. His unyielding commitment to defending Anglican theological positions current in England against Roman Catholicism sometimes borders on obsession. And his quest for support from the distant East serves to underscore the significance of context when examining history. In this case, the East, due to its geographical remoteness, was perceived, perceived and was in fact less of a threat to the Anglican Church than the immediate perceived threat of papalism. This study ultimately underscores the importance of interpreting historical accounts within their unique contexts and not solely through the lens of ideology. By doing so, one can gain a more nuanced and accurate understanding of the complexities that underpin historical narratives, allowing for a more comprehensive assessment of the past and its intricate inter inter interplay of ideas and circumstances in an earnest pursuit of truth. Thank you. Thank you, Father Chrysostomos, for highlighting how the Orthodox Church, the Antiochian Orthodox Church, was inspiring Anglican churchmen seeking a true consistent ecclesial identity independent from the Roman Popal system. We can open the floor for questions or discussion. Any question or Um, may I ask a question from from the virtual? Oh, there is Professor Müller. Uh, yeah, but uh, you can ask the first question. I also would like to ask one. You, you're most welcome, but you are hidden, so we would be grateful if we can see your face, Professor Müller. Or shall I ask the first question, Mr. President? Yes, yes, please. Yes. Um, thank you so much, Father Chrysostomos, for this uh, very, very interesting lecture. Uh, my question is, uh, well, I observed some sim very, very similar uh, kind of thinking in the Lutheran Protestant Church uh, in, um, in Germany. Uh, do you know do you know if there were any relations between Patrick and, uh, well, the, the, the German Lutheran Protestant tradition that used the same arguments? Thank you for your question. Professor Mueller, in studying Paget's work and his interests and his connections, it seemed to me as though he was more insular. In other words, he did not reach out to other theologians um, in the areas you mentioned. He is aware of some of the Calvinist reformed theological positions, but he's very much against them, but he's very much bound by the discussion in England itself. And he is um, focused on what he seems, he, what he deems as being heretical uh, uh, viewpoints. I didn't mention this in my paper. In 1645, he publishes one of his second major works, which is what he calls the heresiography. And in it, he outlines all the heresies that are present in England. So his focus is on England and he doesn't get into other questions of, uh, let's say the Lutheran uh, position. He knew German, so he may have been able to have contacts with people in, in, the, in that area, but we don't have any, any other information about that. Thank you. We had a second question. Yes, I try to 
open the camera, but the system tells me my camera would be used by another application, which I don't know which it is. So maybe I can ask the question without being visible, at least as long as you can hear my voice. Um, Father Friostom, thanks a lot for this highly interesting and important paper, because we should always also take the uh, relations of the Orthodox of Antioch with with the Anglicans or with, with um, Protestants into, into consideration. You mentioned that um, he sent letters to, to different prelates in the region, partly as a, as a letter to all and then individual ones. Have you found any, any kind of feedback? Because I, I recall that Makarius ibn Azaim sent due to his connection with the chaplains in Aleppo, um, a letter to the Archbishop of, of Canterbury but have you found any any response from these Eastern prelates to the requests of the portrait um, divine? Thank you for your question. Uh, as a matter of fact, I have um, grabbed a kind of inkling that perhaps there was a response from Moscow. One of the problems with the letters that Paget wrote is that he's not aware of who is the incumbent of the patriarchs that whom he's a, he is addressing. For example, in his circular letter and his individual letters, there are two different letters individually written to Cyril of Constantinople. Cyril of Constantinople is, of course, Cyril Lucaris, but he was already murdered in the 20s, so he's not the patriarch at the time. Um, the same thing, as I mentioned, is true for, for Athanasius who is also not the patriarch of Antioch. There is um, a question about who is the patriarch of Alexandria. So also his letter to the patriarch of uh, Moscow, which is very, very interesting. It addresses him as the archbishop of Moscow and ecumenical patriarch. So the question of whether or not, I discussed this with Professor Panchenko yesterday, uh, if the Patriarch of Moscow is also called the Ecumenical Patriarch, and by whom is this something that uh, Ephraim Paget kind of is the uh, outcome of his his desire to really placate his his addressee is something that needs further further study. It seems that that may be the case. It's only his own um, kind of decision. So. He has a problem. He's not, he's not exactly clear, clear to whom to send these letters. And when they are received, what is the response? The other interesting thing is that he addresses all four patriarchs of the ancient seas of the Pentarchy in one circular letter, which gives him, which shows that he has a specific understanding of Orthodox ecclesiology, canonical, let's say, structures. Um, we are not sure about his, um, his, any of the responses. There may be a response from Moscow. Um, as far as Makarios, are you mentioned, is this, is this something that you, um, Professor Waldbinder, is this something that you have in mind from what period of his patriarchate? No, I, the, the question was because I think Macarius wrote to, to England, but this was through the, let's say, services of the chaplains in Aleppo. So he was yes. in this, well, it was not Macarius, like course. Macarius, Macarius was, uh, was um, he, he met uh, Isaac Bazir, who was exiled from England, and he was in Aleppo right before Macarius took his trip, uh, his travels along with Paul. So they were in discuss. They were they spoke with one another for several months. Isaac tells us in several of his letters to some of his friends back in England, and Isaac actually gave him a, a, an Arabic translation of his of the Catechism of the Church of England, which I don't know may be of interest because uh, it's first of all it's in Arabic, and secondly it may have influenced certain sections of the um, the work of Macarius. In, in combating um, Protestantism, Calvinism in spe specifically. So because of his meeting with Isaac, maybe that was a way for Makarios to communicate with, 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 um, with people back in England, but this is after Paget had died. 
Paget knew that William Laud had sent letters to Patriarch Cyril of, of, um, of Constantinople, whom he knew since he was uh, the Patriarch of Alexandria. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, so it's time to move to our second speaker, Dr. Hassan Cholak, an associate professor in the field of Ottoman institutions and civilization at the University of Economics and Technology in Ankara. His research focuses on the Greek Orthodox community as part of the Ottoman world. He's definitely a prominent connoisseur and researcher in the Ottoman manuscripts in matter, matters pertaining to the history of the Orthodox Church. We look forward to listen to his presentation today entitled Orthodox Responses to Catholic Missions in the Patriarchate of Antioch, in institu Institutionalization and Centralization. Thank you for being with us, Dr. Turak. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Holy Father, for this uh, very generous introduction. Thank you also for the, uh, for the invitation to the organizers. It's a great honor for me to present my research here in front of this uh, very distinguished uh, audience. So as we have seen and we will continue to see uh, throughout the conference, Catholic Orthodox relations during the early modern period have been analyzed by a series of scholars on the basis of sources produced in a myriad of languages and traditions. However, until recent years, the vital role of the Greek Ottoman uh, archival documents had not been recognized for the history of the uh, Patriarchate of Antioch as much as that of uh, Constantinople. There are two major reasons for this lack of interest, in my opinion. First, the assumption that there was both a physical and mental distance between the Ottoman administration and its Arabic-speaking Muslim and Christian subjects has generated little interest in Ottoman sources among the scholars who study the history of the Patriarchate of Antioch. Second, the history of the non-Constantinopolitan Patriarchates has often been overshadowed by the enormous interest uh, in understanding the interaction between the Ottoman administration and the Patriarchate of Constantinople. As a result, the role of the Ottoman state in the context of the Catholic Orthodox relations has often remained outside the scope of scholarly discussions. The aim of my paper today is to address this little explored field and discuss the role of the Ottoman administration as a core component of the encounters between the Orthodox and Catholic parties in the Patriarchate of Antioch. Chronologically, my paper will focus on the first half of the 18th century, which witnessed a series of conflicts, most notably the schism of 1724. It is well known that the schism in question played a catalyst for a rapprochement between the Patriarchates of Antioch and Constantinople. In my opinion, very few documents illustrate this rapprochement than the following quotation from the synodal decision that condemned the election of Seraphim or Kirillos Tanas as the Patriarch of Antioch and elected Silvestros in his year. We first ran to the imperial rule and saw both all these workers and the partners of such bad one be banished by imperial order. And then we considered it reasonable and declared by common synodal opinion to punish such ones also with ecclesiastical punishment. This passage succinctly outlines the two paths that the patriarchs of Constantinople and Jerusalem followed in punishing uh, Seraphim and his pro-Catholic supporters by seeking an imperial order from the imperial, that is to say the Ottoman rule, and by disciplining them also with ecclesiastical punishment. Since this struggle occurred at a critical time when the Ottoman administration and the Greek Orthodox lay and patriarchal elites were establishing strong ties, a study of the role of the Ottoman administration in the Antiochian schism of 1724 offers a useful grid to understand broader transformations occurring in various strata of the Ottoman state and the Greek Orthodox Church. 
The Ottoman Berat, issued in response to the petition by the Patriarch of Constantinople for the enthronement of Silvestros as the Patriarch of Antioch, resonates the repercussions of the Catholic Orthodox encounter in this patriarchate as seen in the aforementioned synodical decision. Quoting from the petition of the Patriarch of Constantinople, the Berat specifically mentions that, and I quote some Frankish clergymen, drive the Orthodox subjects of the Sultan out of their customary rights. In reference to Islamic law, it, refines, it defines the Orthodox subjects, subjects in question as people of the Demi covenant, drawing on a similar allusion to Islamic terminology, the Barat notes that by making these subjects follow the Frankish rite, they foment mischief, facade. In a clear attempt to present this case as a major problem also for the Ottoman state, the petition makes the claim that these people cease to be the subjects of the Ottoman Sultan, and they have changed their status to a different one. In contrast to the synodical decision, the Barat mentions the names of neither Serafim Kirlos nor his supporters. Instead, it attracts the attention of the Ottoman administration to the collective actions of those who follow the Frankish rite. The document also refers to an undated previous order, which pre prevents their efforts, uh, and I quote, to make someone from those places the patriarch, and which orders that their right be never allowed. What is more, showing the congruence between the discourses of the Ottoman state and the aforementioned synodical decision, the document also identifies the person who would be the patriarch of Antioch as, and I quote, an imperially trusted person who follows the ancient tribe, ancient tribe referring to the Orthodox. Following the precepts of this order, the Ottoman Chancellor was presented with an ideal candidate who was also supported by the chief interpreter of the Imperial Chancellery, who was obviously coming from the uh, Orthodox lay elites known as the Fanariots, who held significant posts within the Ottoman state apparatus since the second half of the 18th century, but more intensively in the 18th century. And this is a very rare case uh, in which the support of a Fanariot is mentioned in a patriarchal barat. As a result, the document continues quoting from the petition of the Patriarch of Constantinople, they have decided to appoint Silvestros, who is also the chief warden, Ketuda, as the document goes, uh, which refers to his position as, a, as the protosingelos of the former patriarch of Antioch, Athanasius of Dabas. It presents Silvestros as someone who, and I quote, is able to lead their ceremonies, is suitable for the patriarchate, is eligible and worthy in all manners, is the choice of all, and is most useful for the, the me subjects of those places. In turn, an imperial order was issued, concluding that Silvestros was appointed as the Patriarch of Antioch and outlining the conditions of his patriarchate in detail. A comparison of this Berat with the other patriarchal Berats offer, offers certain perspectives for an understanding of how the discourse of the Orthodox party functioned, at least in part, in bringing the patriarchate of Antioch in close connection with the Ottoman central administration. The Berat issued for Athanasius at Dabbas in 1720, for instance, gives a colorful representation of the limited role attributed to the central administration, at least in this single episode. Here, the person who petitioned the imperial chancellor is no one other than the Kadi of Damascus, who brought to the attention of the imperial chancellor the fact that, and I quote, the eminent man of the Orthodox community in Damascus came to the Kadi court and requested the following. The quote continues, we prefer that Athanasius be the patriarch on all of us, is our choice and all of us are content with and grateful for him. You shall inform the gate, which is the center of greatness, that he be the patriarch. In brief, in the Barat issued for Athanasios, the role attributed to the central administration is quite limited in comparison with the one issued for Makarios that you see on screen and the one that would be issued for his successor Silvestros four years later. And there's no reference to a payment of Kishkesh, which is the customary lump sum tax that the patriarchal candidates received after, uh, in order to receive, have their uh, barats of investiture. The formulaic uh, expressions referring to the capability of the patriarchal candidates to lead the requisite orthodox ceremonies, their eligibility to be the patriarch in all manners, and the orthodox faithful support for the candidate uh, feature in many patriarchal barats. However, they do not appear in the barats issued for Athanasios in 1720, and showing the rupture in 1724 in the series of barats issued for the patriarchs of Antioch. Above all, the expression referring to Silvestros as 
the most useful for the Demi subjects of those places does not appear in any previous period issued for the patriarchs of Constantinople, Antioch, Jerusalem, and Alexandria. Much later in 1746, the same expression featured in the Barat issued for Matthews of Alexandria and showing the influence that the Barat issued for uh, uh, Silvestros uh, had on the other uh, Barats. In this Barat, we hear not Silvestros' voice, but that of his supporters. However, as I analyzed in my PhD dissertation, which was also published as a book, uh, in corresponding with the Ottoman central administration during his long tenure, Silvestros retains the same discourse in maintaining that he represents the interests of the Orthodox party, that he presented as necessarily in line with the uh, interests of the Ottoman central administration and in opposition to the Catholic uh, party. In a recent art article that I published, I uh, analyzed the brief tenure of Serafim or Kirillos Tanas in 1745 before he was dethroned and replaced by Silvestros in a very short while. As we understand from a register dated from uh, the same year, 1745, the counteroffensive of the Orthodox party led by Paisios and Parthenios, the patriarchs of Constantinople and Jerusalem, managed to have Silvestros restored in his patriarchate. The document offers useful insights into the discourse for Silvestros and against Kirillos. Following a similar strategy as noted at the beginning of this presentation, it draws on the responsibilities of the patriarch to both the church and the state, and the state is the Ottoman state. The document presents the relationship between Silvestros and the Ottoman administration as having a compatible relationship with each other and depicted Kirillos as alien to this relationship. The petition quoted in the document states that the patriarchate has traditionally been granted to those clergymen who are useful for the subjects, who can perform their ceremonies, and who do not belong to a different community. As such, it becomes apparent that there was no need for a change in the patriarchal throne. On a side note, it must be observed here that the expression useful for the subjects was first used in Silvestros Barat in 1724, and here in uh, 20 years, in 1745, it is referred to as part of the tradition. Hence, the church was also contributing to the discourse of the Ottoman state uh, in some ways. Uh, likewise, the petition remarks that the patriarchal throne has been granted to former patriarchs on the condition that they help the subject people, which is an expression directly connected to the usefulness of the patriarch to his flock as a precondition for eligibility. The emphasis on the double responsibility of the patriarch to both the church and the state was made probably in reaction to a certain phrase in Kirillos' Barat, which gives the right of appointing the patriarch of Antioch directly to the Ottoman administration because this patriarchate is not under the jurisdiction of another patriarchate. And uh, by another patriarchate, the document probably refers to the earlier influence of uh, the patriarchs of Constantinople and, and Jerusalem in appointing uh, Silvestros. Uh, the petition also mentions that Silvestro had performed his duties both to the state and the church, as can be seen from the fact that during his tenure there was no problem with respect to the duties of the subjects, to the state, and to the implementation of their ceremonies. After this brief introduction to the nature of the relationship between Silvestros and the Ottoman administration, the petition offers a description of the Catholic missionary activities in the Patriarchate of Antioch. The petition places a special emphasis on the foreign connections of the missionaries and the Orthodox converts to Catholicism. Even though there was no Ottoman law on citizenship or subjected at the time, the petition claimed that through conversion, the community of subjects have left their subjecthood and became Franks. And as such, they have been in betrayal and subversion. What is more, the petition went on. In churches, they read the name of the Pope. In another attempt, to align the interests of the state and the church, the document claims that against the consent of the state and their right, these people want to turn the majority of the Sultan's subjects into Franks. In support of their argumentation, the petition also referred to an undated imperial order issued by Sultan Mustafa, commanding the prevention of the subversion of the room subjects by the community of the Franks and their subordination in their own right. The petition also explains the reason for Silvestros' absence in his diocese as a completely legitimate action, which is also remarked in the barats of another patriarch, namely the patriarch of Constantinople. In reference to the term that necessitates the patriarchs of other places, 
to receive the approval of the Patriarch of Constantinople in visiting Istanbul, the petitioners claimed that Silvestros's visit to Istanbul was a completely legitimate action that occurred with the approval of the Patriarch of Constantinople. Likewise, the petition remarked that in visiting Moldavia, where Silvestros was at the time, Silvestros's aim was merely to collect alms, which is another right recognized in the patriarchal barats. Finally, the petitioners offered a long account of Serafim Kirillos Tanas with a series of charges. They claimed, and I quote, he had been in the Frank right under the training of the Pope for a, for a uh, long time. Interestingly, they do not talk about the role of the French diplomats in this conflict, a role that is well documented and probably well known among the patriarchal and, and lay elites of the Orthodox community. This was probably a prudent strategy not to counter the French political apparatus in the Ottoman Empire, at least directly. As a clear response to uh, Kirillos' petition that attributed to Silvestros a certain fear of forced confinement by the state, the petitioners referred to the initial stages of the conflict between the two contestants during the 1720s. As such, they claimed that even if there were several imperial orders to have Serafim confined in a castle and deal with them, whatever that means, he escaped and could not be caught in any way. The petition also allows us to see how the Orthodox party also used the patriarchal attributes exclusively for Silvestros. In referring to Silvestros, the petitioners use the terminology that are employed for the then uh, current patriarchs. So Silvestros is not uh, referred to as uh, the former patriarch, Patrick Isabuk, as expected in the typical as uh, cases of a change on the patriarchal thrones, but as the holder of this imperial order, the chosen leader of the community of the Christians, the Orthodox Patriarch of Antioch, the patriarch named Silvestros, may his end be auspicious. This is exactly the way the Ottoman documentation referred to the patriarchs uh, during the uh, 18th century, during much of the 18th century. As was the case with the uh, synodical decision quoted at the beginning of my paper, the petitioners also refrained from using the name Kirillos and referred to him as Serafim. What is more, in a potential effort to show that they do not recognize his episcopal consecration and elevation, they stated that Serafim, and I quote, changed his name by inventing the name Kirillos. Ismini ta'ir ve Kirillos namuna isim peydaidir. Which is an expression that is in tune with the practice used in the synodic decision. Even though the imperial order issued in response to this petition referred to Silvestros' appointment as the Patriarch of Antioch as a matter of succession that followed the Patriarchate of Kirillos, the petitioners denied the validity of Kirillos' brief tenure when it came to referring to the fact that he also enjoyed the recognition of the Ottoman administration, they used an expression that we also see in the documents issued by imperial chancery in cases of reversing the contents of, the, of a previous imperial order. That is, they claimed that Serafim managed to have himself forgiven and receive a barat somehow, bir uh, tarikle. Either as a result of the brevity of Kirillos's tenure or the petitioner's strong discourse vis-a-vis -vis the Ottoman authorities, a highly worn out and labored paper in draft in the Ottoman archives refers to Silvestros's restoration in the patriarchal throne as, and I quote, uh, reappointed without removal, ipka olun makbabında. Some connotations of the centralization and institutionalization of the Patriarchate of Antioch at the time of Silvestros can also be seen in the rivalry between two Orthodox uh, metropolitans, namely Paisios of Gümüşhane, Argyropolis, which was in uh, Northeastern Asia Minor, and uh, under the jurisdiction of the Patriarchate of Constantinople, and Agathangelos of Diyarbakir, Amida, which was under the jurisdiction of the Patriarchate of Antioch in Southeastern Asia Minor. The problem, as it first appeared in an imperial order issued in 1749, was in response to a petition by Patriarch, of, uh, Patriarch Silvestros of Antioch, and it regarded so-called intrusions by the Metropolitan of Gimishane, who, Silvestros claimed, was not content with his own jurisdiction. The documents seem to report that the two Metropolitanates were different, başka başka metropolitik and Paisios was correspondingly ordered to refrain from such intrusions. Not long after, Silvestros submitted yet another petition, stating that Paisios had taken no notice of the previous order, and as such, he should be admonished. And if he, sh if he should uh, persist in such behavior, he should be removed from his position. 
This time, another order was issued asking Paisios to obey the previous order, but he was not removed from his position. However, as it turned out later, following the intervention of the Patriarch of Constantinople, Paisios had, be, had been reportedly conducting services for Orthodox believers who were coming from Gümüşhane, Gümüşhanelü or Gümüşhane Rayas as the, ter, as the uh, document terms it. But uh, these uh, Orthodox believers from Gümüşhane were working in the mines in and around the Arbekir. So we are talking about the seasonal uh, migration and the conflicts arising from this, uh, from this uh, uh, fact. Accordingly, it was ordered that the Metropolitan of Gümüşhane had the right to conduct services for miners from Gümüşhane wherever they might be employed. In spite of the Patriarch of Constantinople's intervention, successfully reversing the order issued in favor of Silvestros, uh, Silvestros did not give up the case. It, until at least uh, 1743, the Patriarchs of Constantinople and Antioch bombarded the Ottoman Chancery with petitions and managed several times to reverse the decisions issued in each other's favor. Although the controversy continued for some more time, even these preliminary stages demonstrate the ability of the Patriarch of Antioch to resist the challenges posed first by a nearby metropolitan under the jurisdiction of the Patriarch of Constantinople, and second by the Patriarch of Constantinople himself. An important element of the story is that Silvestros owed his enthronement and re-enthronement as Patriarch of Antioch in 1724 and 1745 to the partial support of two Patriarchs of Constantinople. Therefore, even in cases where the Patriarchs of Constantinople played a key role in the appointment of the Patriarch of Antioch, their correspondence with the Ottoman administration did not necessarily place the Patriarchs of Antioch in an inferior situation in its relations with the Ottoman central administration. On the contrary, the Eastern Patriarchs, including the Patriarchs of Antioch, could also undermine or even challenge the authority of the Ecumenical Patriarch through offers of, their, uh, of increasing cooperation with the Ottoman administration. As far as the role of the rapprochement between the Ottoman administration and the Patriarchate of Con uh, Antioch is concerned, especially in the specific case of the Arbekir, Silvestros owed his ability to bombard the imperial chancery with a series of petitions to a single document, a barat issued by the Ottoman administration for Agatangeros of the Arbekir in 1739. As noted in, clearly in this barat, Agatang Agatangeros had been occupying his metropolitan see without a barat, Bila barat. However, shortly afterwards, when he received the official recognition of the Ottoman administration, Silvestros was able to challenge the Metropolitan of Gimushan. So to conclude, as I tried to uh, show in this, in this paper, together with the Antiochian schism, relations between the Patriarchate of Antioch and the Ottoman administration against the effects of the Catholic infiltration also assumed a strong and continuous character in many spheres. These relations eventually culminated in the institutionalization and centralization of the Patriarchate of Antioch in close cooperation with the Ottoman central administration. Against the presumptions of several scholars, this institutionalization and centralization did not lead to the domination of the Patriarchate of Antioch by that of Constantinople. On the contrary, Silvestros became able to cooperate with the Ottoman administration directly and use the offers of this close interaction. In one of his interactions with the Ottoman administration, he managed to receive a barat for the metropolitan of Diyarbakir and this barat eventually enabled him to challenge the Metropolitan of Gimishane under Constantinopolitan jurisdiction. Overall, as a trained Ottomanist working on the history of the Orthodox Church in the Ottoman Empire, I would like to finish my presentation by emphasizing the great potential for the rapprochement between the thriving fields of Ottoman and ecclesiastical studies. I thank you very much for your invitation and for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Cholak, for emphasizing the importance of the role of the Antiochian patriarchs, Silvestros, Macarius, Athanasius, and many others. And the efforts they devoted in order to safeguard the Antiochian orthodoxy, the identity of the Orthodox patriarchate by bridging their relations with the sultanic 
authorities. Uh, we open the floor for questions and discussion. Dr. Ayush. Dr. Daniel Ayush, Professor Ayush. You don't, now it's fine, yes. Thank you, doctor, for your presentation. And uh, two terms uh, drew my attention in your presentation. Uh, one is about uh, the use of Frank and Frankish right. Uh, I was asking myself where it comes from in, in Turkish and what is on Ottoman language, I mean, and what is meant with uh, actually with this. I understand something like the Latins or the Roman Catholic, but why exactly this term? And the other thing that uh, uh, really drew my attention was the use of community for millet. Uh, although in English, usually they don't translate it, they say millet for particularly the, the communities in the Ottoman uh, Empire. Thank you very much for, uh, for these questions. Regarding the terms uh, Frank and Frankish, uh, the original terms used are a French and Frank which are, I think, used uh, interchangeably. Uh, you could come across these terms uh, quite often in the same document. Uh, and what they mean by this, this term, I think, necessarily refers to their foreign uh, origin. So uh, you rarely see the term uh, Catholic, for example. I think, I mean, I studied around uh, 40 files and uh, 40 uh, notebooks and around 20 uh, files. So leading up to thousands of documents, uh, correspondence between the uh, church and the uh, Ottoman administration. And I rarely see the term Catholic, uh, but you do, you do see it. But what struck me was not so much the you know, presence of the words a French and Frank, but the uh, little prominence of, of the word uh, Catholic. Catholic. Uh, regarding the uh, second question, uh, the term millet, as, as uh, Professor Papadimitriou in the morning reminded us, uh, we Ottomans are, are, are rarely using this term uh, because since 1980s, there were some challenges to the presumption that there was a system called the Ottoman millet system in which all the communities were uh, represented by a certain millet washi ethnarch. Uh, so we, we no longer uh, continue this practice, and I think researchers like mine are, are proves that you know there was no such thing as, as a millet system as a, as a hierarchical uh, relationship in which the you know the ethnarch was uh, controlling the whole community. So I could see in the Ottoman documentation, for example, that the Ottoman the, the Orthodox uh, patriarchs of Antioch, Jerusalem, or Alexandria could freely contact the Ottoman administration directly without the uh, without the need to uh, ask for the mediation of the Patriarch of Constantinople. Uh, so uh, there are serious question marks next to the term millet and the millet system, uh, especially in the early modern context. Uh, but regarding the 19th century practices, which is not my specialty, but through at least some documentation that I have seen, I could, see, I could say that there was a process of codification for the whole empire uh, after the Tanzimat reforms in the 19th century. And uh, as part of these reforms, the Ottoman state asked the uh, patriarchates in its domains to uh, cooperate with them, to write down their regulations. And in doing this, they assumed that there was a system, which as a historian is, is not convincing me, <laughs> uh, I have to say. But they assumed that there was a there was a system. There were you know forms of relationships uh, between different patriarchates, and uh, this system, uh, if we may use the term for for the 19th century at least, was a highly centralized one. And so you don't see any references, for example, to uh, the patriarchs of Armenian patriarchs of uh, other places than Constantinople. Uh, so they assumed that the Armenian patriarch was the sole representative of, of, uh, of the uh, Armenian community. The same with the Orthodox Church. And 
this was the 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 uh, the uh, discourse of the uh, in the individuals connected to the Patriarchate of Constantinople for a very long time. So, so we can trace this discourse in the uh, Greek sources, for example. Uh, and uh, by looking at the Ottoman documentation, I think uh, we can also see that there was some sort of a centralizing trend, but it was not accepted as a rule that was started at the time of Mehmed II and continued, you know, without any change uh, in the following centuries. So that's why I, I, I prefer the term uh, community, uh, but yeah, millet and taifa community, they, they, they are, yeah, they can be used you know, interchangeably, but I don't use the term uh, millet system or millet bashi uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, so I, I don't know if this answers your question. Thank you. It, maybe it's worth mentioning Dr. Ayush that even the Arabic sources, early Arabic sources, refer to Roman Catholicity and in general, but more specifically to the Crusaders as Firanja. They are never referred to as Crusaders, as Salibiyin in Arab, Arabic sources. Firanja. So uh, the name Crusaders exactly as the name Byzantine are late, late uh, intruder terminology to, to historiography. Uh, we have a question from His Eminence, Metropolitan Damaskinos. Please, Your thank Eminence. You, thank you. Bima anna amna tahaddas an al-mustalahat, atmanna anna tawdah al-mustalah li nista'amlu al-yom min ul استعمل الدكتور كلمة الروم الأرثوذكس كما سبقه أشخاص آخرين من المحاضرين واستعملوا كلمة الروم الأرثوذكس اليوم نحن منسمي الروم الأرثوذكس في الغرب غريك أرثوذكس مما يجعل الكثيرين من الناس يعتبرون أننا يونان وليس روم لأنه ما بيعرف شو كلمة الروم لذلك بحب أعرف أن الدكتور كلمة غريك أرثوذكس أمتى ولدت وليش Thank you very much, uh, Your Grace, for the question. Uh, I think, I mean, working in different languages, I see this problem with terminologies, mostly in the Western languages. So in, in, uh, in Turkish, Ottoman Turkish, I mean, in Arabic or in Greek, the terms are, are I think, more, com uh, more uh, compatible with each other. But uh, as, as uh, Father also mentioned, there are references to Greek church, whatever Greek means at the time. So, uh, yeah, exactly. Uh, so I think if we want a satisfactory answer to uh, your question, we should start with the developments in the Western languages, how they you know, differentiate between Greek and Greek Orthodox uh, or Orthodox, uh, or how they interpret the term room, which is an extremely complicated term. I mean, when we were preparing uh, this book with my colleague Elif Bayrak Dartalan, we said, you know, we specifically use the translated term as orthodox because in the ecclesiastical sense, it refers to the orthodox. Rum uh, Kilisesi, the orthodox church. Uh, but there is a literature of its own, uh, the term as, as a literature of its own. Uh, we were just discussing with uh, Ilyas yesterday uh, that in Ottoman studies, the term could refer to many other things, even including uh, the uh, Muslim population from the Balkans and from uh, Asia Minor in the 16th century. So I think it's a very valid question that we are always juggling with. Uh, but the answer, I think, is not so much in the Eastern languages, but more in the, in the Western language, uh, languages, I feel. Thank you very much. Father Jacques Khalil, Father Dean. Doctor, سؤالي ما يلي عندما نستعمل في الغرب في في أمريكا اللاتينية مثلا نستعمل كلمة Orthodox بالنسبة لي للشعوب هناك تعني اليهود وليس تعني المسيحية. هذه كلمة كتير معقدة إذا لم نستعمل كلمة أخرى مع Orthodox لنشير إلى أننا من من المسيحية.
Yes, I, I truly appreciate the, the comment. Thank you very much. Gave, you gave us today another evidence of uh, Patriarch Silvestros as a churchman uh, independent of any uh, uh, ethnical, um, how to say, uh, a thrust in his leadership of the Church of Antioch. And um, you, you, you added also to what we heard previously by Professor Valbiner, that at that time in the 18th century, 17th and 18th century, among the Orthodox in the East, there was uh, no differentiation between, uh, between clergymen coming from different parts of the same Ottoman Empire. We, we, hear, we always hear about a Greek hegemony on the Church of Antioch. And this may be true, maybe starting from, uh, this is my question too, maybe from the 19th century after the Greek Revolution. So my question, do you think that the Greek Revolution was a turning point um, in, in the relationship between all Orthodox patriarchates in the East? And from what point of time from your studies, we can speak about influence of Greeks on the Patriarchate of Antioch. Define this period, please. Thank you very much, Father, for this uh, very good question. Uh, I also think about this from time to time. I mean, I'm a trained Ottomanist. I was not trained in ecclesiastical history at all. This is everything that I learned from, from, from the books. Uh, but when I started reading uh, alongside the documents, reading in the secondary literature, I always came up with this idea that there was a clash. Uh, a clash which I haven't seen in the, in the documents, in the Ottoman documents at least. Uh, and I think, I, I agree, at least to some extent, the Greek Revolution played a certain part in this, in this, uh, in this uh, change of terminologies. Uh, but I'm not an expert on the 19th century. I'm interested in the history of Greek Revolution only through the works of uh, individuals who were not so religious, if I may use the term, uh, people like uh, Adamantios Korais, for example. Uh, but uh, intellectuals like Adamantios Korais were not so much interested in the eastern parts of the Orthodox world. So they were more interested in the Greek uh, part of uh, the Ottoman Empire, if I may use the term. Uh, but I, I believe the answer is in the 19th century. Uh, I'm not very familiar with the uh, domestic sources of the Patriarchate of Antioch. I read only a couple of the chronicles, like the chronicle by uh, Mihail Breik. And uh, there too, I, I, I did not feel that there was uh, so much reaction against the election of uh, Silvestros. Thank you. We have two online questions. Um, Mr. Anastasios. Uh, yes, uh, thank you, um, Dr. Dr. Trilla. You, yes. uh, thank you for that excellent presentation. I was so looking forward to meeting you and I've admired your work. So uh, thank you for what you, your contributions. Um, I have just kind of a, a, a question about this aspect of your argument centralization institutionalization of the ottoman um of the ottoman empire in uh in general and how they're using their opportunity to work with the church of antioch in order to achieve that um the fanariots you mentioned are assisting in the process but i guess the question is why are they doing this at this time and most and i'm thinking about this kind of larger question that has been coming up in Ottoman studies, which has to do with confessionalization. Is this a period of, of confessionalization where even within, let's say, the Islamic context, they're focusing on their orthodoxy and orthopraxy uh, within a Sunni context and looking at other, um, other confessional, uh, other communities? 
um, and, and they're very sensitive to these things in their own context and are looking at what's happening amongst their, their own communities uh, and not wanting to have um, kind of, well, trying to affirm these orthodoxies. And so I guess I, I'm just trying to think about why at this time and if it's part of this confessionalization process. Thank you very much, Professor Papadimitriou, for these two questions. Uh, I don't have so much of an answer for the second uh, question because I'm not well versed with the debate on confessionalization, but uh, from what I can see uh, in the projects led by Tiana Kristich and Perin Terzolo, for example, there appears to be something quite similar in the 18th century. I'm not so much sure about the context, whether it was exactly the same context in uh, Habsburg studies and, and the Ottoman cases, uh, especially in the 18th century. I'm not so much sure about this context, but I, I see lots of parallelisms. This is uh, the most that I can say. Mm. Uh, regarding the term institutionalization and centralization, I think this, is, this works both ways, both for the Ottoman state and uh, also for, uh, for the Orthodox Church. And most probably for the other churches as well, uh, the ones that had connections at least with, uh, with the uh, imperial capital. Um, so uh, the, the Ottoman administration, Ottoman, Ottoman state was going through a drastic change in the 18th century. So uh, the 17th century is often characterized by uh, lots of social uh, appeals uh, in the provinces. And the ideal sultan, according to the you know, writers of the, prince, uh, the, the uh, advice uh, literature, uh, are sultans who are leading their armies in the battlefield and engaging in holy war against the, against the uh, enemies. Uh, but at the end of the 17th century, it's quite clear, even to you know, the, the individuals from, from this uh, particular genre, that the solution is something different. Solution is somewhere in which the uh, Ottoman state is on par with its dealings with the uh, Europeans in ways other than warfare. And so there was uh, much room for diplomacy and the Fanagos were the ideal candidates for this, for this uh, post. And so institutionalization of the church was somewhat influenced by the way the Fanagos rose to power, but it also transformed the way the Ottoman state was institutionalized and centralized in the 18th century as well. So this is, uh, this is the way I, I understand the term, uh, the two terms. Uh, why the Fanariots were so important for the Ottoman authorities? I think this, this has to do with uh, how the Ottoman administration understood the church as an institution. So there is this you know, long debate whether the Ottoman administration saw the church as an institution. I think it does. Uh, um, and uh, it also recognizes it as a, as a network. So it's an institution, it's made up of with uh, people, including uh, laymen and, and, and uh, clergymen. And that's why they, they, the, the fanariots are part of this system too. But uh, in the recent years, I shifted my interest to uh, intellectual uh, networks between Ottoman Muslim and Christian intellectuals. And there, you also see some other intermediaries, uh, like the uh, man uh, known by the name of Yanyala Esad Efendi uh, from, from Yanina, modern day uh, Yanina in Greece. Uh, he was a Greek speaking uh, Ottoman, what? He had many uh, qualities. He was an astronomer. He was a, a copy editor for the Mutaferika Press in Istanbul. He was uh, correspondent of the Patriarch of Jerusalem, Chrysanthos and Taras, and he was a translator of the works of Aristotle. And uh, if we look at the letters between Chrysanthos and Taras and, and this Yanyala Zalapandi, you see that they, they talk about you know, ecclesiastical affairs. They talk about the status of the uh, holy sites, for example. And so uh, the Ottoman administration was probably in, in, in a connection with individuals like this. So they, they saw the church as a network and to this network, there were different channels. And these channels, I think also involved uh, Muslims who were different from the other normal Muslims, if I may use the term. I don't know if this answers your question, Professor, but this yes. is uh, what I can elaborate. Yes, thank you very much. Very, very interesting. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Cholak for your enriching contribution. 
we have to move ahead to our third distinguished friend, professor and contributor, Professor Andreas Muller from the Albrecht, Christian Albrecht University of Kiel. He's a professor for church history and religious history, a German, a brilliant German scholar, a good friend of orthodoxy, of the Orthodox Church, of the history of the Orthodox Church, and of Orthodox theology. The title of his presentation is the Greek Orthodox Church of Antio and Antiochia in Modern Western Literature, an overview. Professor Muller, the floor is yours. Mr. President, eminences, excellences, honored fathers, dear colleagues and students, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great honor for me to give a lecture in the University of Balamand. I wanted to visit Balamand since my times of study in Greece, and it's a pity not to be with you in Lebanon these days. Be sure that all my thoughts are in Balamand now. I declare in this difficult time my full solidarity with all the people suffering in Middle East now, particularly with the civic population of Palestine, Gaza, and Lebanon. May our Lord protect your countries and give peace to all people all over the world. I changed a little bit the title of my presentation. And I will speak about the Greek Orthodox Church of Antioch in modern German literature in overview. First, a short introduction. In modern times, Orthodox churches have repeatedly been noticed in Western European literature. Information about them can be found in travel reports, but also in extensive uh, treatises written by theologians. The Patriarchate of Antioch is occasionally touched upon, but before the 19th century, it played only a minor role. In general, the individual accounts of the Rome Orthodox in the Syrian Lebanese region are always guided by certain interests of the authors. In addition, the sources or informants available determine which information is included in the portrayals at all. In any case, they offer important testimony to intercultural exchange and the perception of the Oriental counterpart. On the one hand, it becomes clear how stereotypes are constantly reinforced, but on the other hand, new elements are also highlighted in the portrayal of the other through specific questions in one's own culture. In the following, I can only present a few selected examples, and I will start with the Rome Orthodox Patriarchate of Antigone before 1724. Even before 1724, there are occasional mentions of the Patriarchate of Antioch in Western literature, but no more detailed descriptions, and especially only a very few immediate impressions. Often the Patriarchate is referred to in historical perspective. Martin Luther already addressed Antioch in a historical perspective in his 1539 uh, book, Von den Concilien und Kirchen on Councils and the Churches. Rome not only had problems with the fact that the East had independently appointed bishops like Flavian, rather the Roman church had also disturbed the Antiochian church claim to be the oldest and first church of all. Luther's reference to the Antiochian Patriarchate thus also served to strengthen his criticism of the papal church. 
Only in the 16th century, a report by the Austrian embassy preacher Salomon Schweiger, who personally visited Syria and Lebanon in 1581, is particularly noteworthy. He did not publish his terrible report until 1608. And I will mention it now, Salomon Schweiger on the Christians in Syria and Lebanon. After several years as Austria's embassy preacher in Constantinople, Schweiger set off for Egypt in 1581 with two other fellow travelers and then traveled via Jerusalem and Damascus to Tripoli and from there back towards Venice. In Constantinople in February 1581, he had received not only letters of recommendation from the Sultan, but also one from Patriarch Jeremias II and one from the Patriarch of Antioch, Michael VI. According to Schweiger, the latter had been in Constantinople in, with some jobs, he says, uh, specifically, it was probably about regaining the patriarchal chair, which had been denied to him by Joachim V. Michael wrote um, a letter of recommendation for the travel group, which is printed in the travel report in German translation and with a tracking of the patriarch's signature. You can see it here. Schweiger's image of Greek orthodoxy is by no means positive. He rather attests to its unbelief and lack of understanding. Nevertheless, he not only visited the Patriarchate in Constantinople, but also that in Alexandria, Jerusalem, and Antiochia. Schweiger questions the fasting practice of the Orthodox churches vis-a-vis -vis the Jerusalem Patriarch and accused them of works righteousness. From 22nd to 30 May, Schweiger stayed in Damascus and met the patriarch Joachim V there, who left his entry in the pastor's family book, the album Amicorum. You can see it here. Schweiger describes him as a man of 60 whom he met at breakfast, which included good strong wine. Schweiger mentioned, uh, mentions that the patriarch had knitting materials lying next to him because he would knit gloves. Such an occupation would not require as much thoughts as the study of scripture. From remarks like these, one can clearly read the arrogance of the Protestant pastor who was concerned with the study of scripture. Schweiger further mentions that he was also treated honestly and kindly by the priesthood of the patriarchate. The clergy had also all written in his family book, which has been preserved to this day. Schweiger also notes that monks lived in the patriarchate, that the patriarch only refers to himself as the patriarch of the great city, even though large areas of Asia and Syria belong to his jurisdiction. Schweiger describes Tripoli as a beautiful city with pretty streets and buildings. The inhabitants are good and the city offers security. Arabic is spoken everywhere in the commercial city where Greeks, Jews, Turks and Arabs live, but also Venetians and French. Schweiger reports of Western merchants in diplomats in the Eastern Mediterranean, but does not mention missionary activities of Western churches in Syria and Lebanon. In other accounts of the time, we can read of the activities of Western churches on uh, the grounds, uh, on the ground, but these are not associated with the, in this time, still so-called Melkites. Let us first turn to another text written before uh, 1724, which does not reflect the work of the Roman church in Syria. Although this travel report was not written by Ge German, uh, its German translation was widely received in the German speaking world. And because I just have um, 20 minutes, I will skip this very interesting report. And uh, I will only mention, well, that. Um, it's a lot about uh, 
all the, the rituals in the uh, Greek Orthodox and also in the Antiochian Orthodox uh, tradition. Let's come to the um, third example, the presentation of the Greek church by Johann Michael Heinecius. In 1711, Johann Michael Heinecius, at that time already a very Prussian consistory counselor and senior pastor at the Liebfrauenkirche in Halle, published a very comprehensive account of the old and new Greek church. Unlike Tunefort, Heinecius did not travel to the Levant himself, but he used an enormous amount of literature and travel reports in his account. Heinecius was interested in interdenominational perspective. Accordingly, he, has, he also evaluated the early dialogues and attempts to influence the Orthodox by the Western churches. Within Greek Orthodoxy, for each individual topos, he first presents the all church conditions and then those among the new Greeks. Basically, Heinecius emphasized the ignorance of the Greek clergy and thus served the common stereotype. Heinecius occasionally refers to the early church patriarchate of Antioch, but only states in general terms about the present situation. I quote, as far as I know, no one has written about the state of the church of Antioch, which is also very poor in, in his own writings. End of quotation. Nevertheless, Heinecius in, this, in his three uh, ties on the early church patri patriarchates remarks on the present state of affairs. The patriarch of Antioch, who calls himself patriarch of the great city of God at Antioch and of the whole Orient, lives at Damascus and governs the churches in Syria, Isauria, Kilikia, and other Asian provinces. End of quotation. Both the Patriarch of Jerusalem and the Patriarch of Antioch were poor and not particularly respected by Turks and Greeks. Heinecius refers to Schweiger's report that the Patriarch of Antioch would knit gloves. Accordingly, at least according to Heinecius, there would be no major intrigues in the election of these Patriarchs, unlike in the case of the Ecumenical. Rather, people were chosen who, quotation, had some merit in piety and skill, end of quotation. The Constantinople Patriarch would serve as a mediator between the Oriental Patriarchs and the High Port. Apart from that, Heinecius also reports that the Chalcedonian churches or the actual Greeks are called Melkites in the Orient and occasionally also in the rest of the Orthodox world. In the Middle East, they would perform their divine services in the Arabic language. Furthermore, Heinecius mentions in passing that Macarius III of Antiochia also signed the Confession, uh, Confessio Ecclesiae Greke Orthodoxa of uh, Petrus, uh, Peter Mogila in 1643. Thus, the latter would at least have supported a definition of the Orthodox faith that was critical of Protestantism. Let's come to the third chapter, the churches in Syria and Lebanon after 1724. Overviews of Orthodoxy that were as extensive as those of uh, Heinecius are rarely found in the European West after 1724. On the other hand, the union efforts of the Roman church were increasingly taken into account. An equally little known travel report bears witness to this, and that's the travel report by Carsten Niebuhr. A very impressive text which offers a lot of details, especially on Lebanon, has hardly been considered in the scholarly, uh, scholarly literature on the Orthodox churches so far. It is the account of Carsten Niebuhr, who traveled to the Orient with a six-man expedi expedition team on behalf of the Danish king. The expedition served the philological, natural, history, and geographical exploration of Arabia in the spirit of the Enlightenment. 
Niebuhr traveled as a cartographer, but also described in details the country, its people, culture, and even the local religions. Since his traveling companions all died on the way to India, the enlightened mathematician was the only one of his group to reach the Levant in, 1600, uh, in 1766. His account of this region can be found in the second volume of his travel memoirs published in 1778. Niebuhr's main source seems to have been Maronite questions. At any rate, he points out that he even met such people in Copenhagen after his return and processed uh, their information. European monks in the Levant also seem to have served him as informants. Accordingly, his statements on the Catholic Christians are much more detailed than on the Roman Orthodox. He even attributed a patriarch of Antioch to the Maronites, but also refers to the fact that among them an Oriental party fights against European alienation. In general, he notes that even among the Maronites, there's a Eurocritical attitude, which also leads to young people not being sent to study in the West. Niebuhr notes about the other autochthonous uh, uh, questions on site, by no means correct in everything. And I quote him, in the large and fertile mountain range of Lebanon, there are also many Christians who are called Greeks because they used to belong to the Greek church. However, their clergy often understand less Greek than the Maronites understand Syriac, and therefore the services are mostly held in Arabic. They also have their own patriarch, but free summarily only since they have united with the Roman church. And I believe that not even the other non-united Greeks who do not live in the territory of the Jews care for this patriarch, but that the Pope only attaches this, uh, the title to a local clergyman in order to have a Greek patriarch in the Levant. So it's not all correct, but uh, it's very interesting to read what he mentioned. Niebuhr thus primarily comments on the so-called Greek Catholic questions, describing them very critically from a Lutheran perspective. In any case, he already mentions in the, uh, in the 18th century that the uh, native Christians do not consider it at all indifferent that the Pope attaches the title of Patriarch to the renegades that the European monks and their disciples are making more and more renegades of the old commoners, thereby causing disunity and completely ruining many good families. And he finally sums up, the disunity of the Christians is always a gain for the Turkish authorities. That's at least what he thought, Karst Niebuhr. While Karst Niebuhr is not sparing in his criticism of the Roman Catholic Church in the Levant, he only mentions the, over, uh, the other long established Christianity is in passing. He notes that in all Syrian cities, there are also still many Greeks, Armenians and Jacobites who recognize the patriarchs of Constantinople, Echmiadzin and Diabakr as the chiefs. When he describes the individual districts of Lebanon in the following and speaks of Christians, their monasteries and also Official, official seats, it is never quite clear whether he means Greek Catholic or Greek Orthodox Christians. This even applies to the Greeks mentioned in Beirut. Not, nor does the Enlightenment cartographer provide any more precise information on the theology and piety of the local Christians. He mainly highlights things that seem objectionable, objectionable uh, to him, such as the fact that Christians in Lebanon generally still practice the law of the fast and blood feud, even if the bishops try to reconcile the disputing parties. 
So much for the Western literature on the Roman Orthodox Patriarchate of Antioch up to the 18th century. Up to then, the information is quite general and not very productive. It is actually only the accounts from the 19th century onwards that become more important, which is why I would like to offer a brief outlook on at least two works in the following. And I come to Oriental Christianity in the Mediterranean countries, according to the travel report of Karl Beet. One of the most interesting descriptions of the situation in the Rome Orthodox Patriarchate of Antioch at the beginnings of the 20th century was offered by the Berlin theologian and private lecturer in systematic theology, Karl Beet. He set out on a five month uh, research trip to the Levant on 3rd March, 1901, and described his immediate perceptions in a travel report published as early as 1902. Beit was basically concerned with an important piece uh, of the mosaic in the overall picture of Christianity, to which the Christian East also belonged despite its lack of theological education and literature. So Beit too uses the classical, uh, the classic stereotypes of Orthodox Christianity, but considers an account of the present state of the churches based on eyewitness testimony and personal inquiry to be indispensable. In the age of nationalism, a particular interest was the preoccupation with a national feeling with which the denominations in the countries of the Orient had grown. Bit thus certainly also due to the current situation of interest in Germany, draws the church in Syria into the fields of conflict around nationalism and philatism. Unlike Hynekius, Bit perceived an unbroken chain of frictions and schisms in the history of the Antiochian Patriarchate since the 16th century. Since 1724, the Antiochian Patriarchs would be appointed by the Holy Synod of Constantinople. That's what he wrote. In his time, Beit sees the Patriarchate of Antioch as a pawn between Greek and Russian interests. The background of this was the fact that the national composition of the Syrian population was very heterogeneous. Russian policy, supported by the Russian Palestine Association, would try to slavify the region or uh, annex it to the Russian sphere of influence. It would try to achieve by this by promoting the Arab identity of, Christian, um, of Christianity locally. According to their claim, all local Christians were Arabs or Syrians. The Greeks, on the other hand, assumed that Christianity, or indeed most of the population of Syria and Palestine, was originally Greek. Accordingly, the Patriarchate of Antioch also belonged to the Greek sphere of influence and was to be led appropriately by a Greek hierarchy. According to Beit, it was precisely over this hierarchy that massive disputes had recently arisen. Patriarch Meletius, who was massively promoted by the Russian party and elected by the Antiochian Senate, was not recognized by the other Orthodox patriarchs and also by the Greek speaking population of Syria and was even described by the Ecumenical, uh, Ecumenical Patriarchate as a creature of the Russian Palestine Association. Beit assesses the situation in such a way that an understanding of the Greeks with members of the diocese is not possible. The Greek church has been guilty of serious failures by ignoring the Arab identity and characterizing the appointment of Arabic speaking Iraqs as a Russian idea. Accordingly, the ecumenical patriarchate would have to press for far-reaching concessions. The rationale for this is clear. I quote, for Russian influence is rapidly increasing throughout Syria and Palestine. Even if the Hellenic side, especially the bishops, agitate firstly against Russia, 
the population will not refuse to thank this protector of their interests. They will completely forget that the Russians are only pursuing their own plans, end of quotation. Bid also describes other measure, measures uh, taken by Meletius or consequences of the Russian measures, all of which make clear his main interest in the Antiochian Patriarchate. The German was also concerned with a critical confrontation with Russian imperial policy. Bid not only addresses the current disputes due to nationalism and philatism, he also gives some general information about the Patriarchate, which had already taken up residence in Damascus since 1269, fleeing from the Mamluks. It is the most extensive Patriarchate with only 200,000 Christians in this time. However, it is difficult to give exact details, details of the dioceses and the archbishop, uh, archbishoprics because they are in a very dilapidated state. In any case, 16 dioceses belong to the Patriarch. I come to my last chapter, the confessional studies of Friedrich Heyer. In 1977, Friedrich Heyer, a confessional scholar from Heidelberg, also offered a confessional overview, although not explicitly based on direct memories of his travels. He dealt with the Patriarchate of Antioch in the chapter Orthodox Churches of the East. And I skipped some parts of my lecture, of my manuscript. Higher study of confessions is not only shaped uh, by the turmoil of the Cold War, but also by the encounters within the ecumenical movement and the associated interest in church practice in other confessions. Accordingly, he also devotes himself to the Orthodox youth movement cultivated by the Patriarchate, which had been shaped in particular by George Skoda and Ignatius Hakim. Finally, Haya refers to the founding of the Academy in Balamant. In this way, he no longer perpetuates the stereotype of the lack of education in Orthodox environment, but instead, takes an eye-to-eye -eye view of the Antiochian Patriarchate. However, with regard to Balamant, he also perceives that the appointment of Pantelemon Rodopoulos as rector in Balamant is a sign of overcoming the traditional anti-Greek complex in the Antiochian Patriarchate. I come to a short summary. Even if Hayas' portrayal is also shaped by concrete interests, such as those in the situation during the Cold War and in the ecumenical movement, his account nevertheless stands for the increasing efforts of Western authors in the second half of the 20th century to create an objective and appreciative perception of the Orthodox counterpart. Previously, Orthodoxy had been portrayed much more strongly as alien, often even unlearned. Authors such as Schweiger emphasized the lack of scriptural scholarship, even of the Antiochian patriarchs. It was only with Hynecius that information about the work of the Roman Catholics in Syria and Lebanon emerged, which Niebuhr strongly criticized, especially after 1724. A first really knowledgeable account of the developments in the Patriarchate of Antioch in this time was offered only by Karl Beet. Looking at Russian politics, he made it clear that not only Rome, but also Moscow endeavored to gain massive influence over the Patriarchate. Beet's critical view, like that of his predecessors, was also shaped by his own interests and ideals in Western Europe. I thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Müller, for uncovering these witnesses, these important witnesses from German travelers describing the difficult circumstances through which the Antiochian church managed 
and the Antiochian patriarchs managed to preserve Orthodox faith and Orthodox identity against all odds. I open the floor for questions and discussions. Professor Slim, Dr. Suad Slim. Uh, you spoke about the influence of Russian diplomats about the Arab, uh, on the Arab nationalistic uh, current in the Orthodox Church. But if we look at if we look at the Orthodox Church, also some Russian Orientalists like uh, Vendeli Juzi had exposed in uh, the periodical Palestinsky Zbornik about the, uh, the feeling of Orthodox to be Syrian or Greek or Arab. And for himself, after a long study of each choice, he said that those Orthodox were essentially Syriac and from uh, Syriac origin, uh, in spite of the fact that his uh, country or his uh, initial uh, identity was with Russia. Yeah, thank you so much for, for this remark. I, it was not my opinion. Uh, it was the opinion of Karl Beet I mentioned. And I think he saw everything in, um, in Lebanon, in Syria in this time, well, from the perspective of a German, a German who is part of a German society which is in strong struggle with uh, the Russians. Uh, also in the Middle East, you know that uh, the German emperor in the beginning of the 20th century uh, came to, to, to Syria, to, um, to Israel, to the holy places, uh, just to show the, the German influence on this area. And I think when Karl Bitt is talking about the influence of uh, the Russians um, to support Arabic identity, it's from his perspective against, uh, well, uh, Russian influence uh, in, uh, in this area. Uh, that's what I wanted to mention. Everybody who was writing about uh, the, the Antiochian Patriarchate wanted to, well, to support uh, his own op opinion and uh, his own perspective on, on this region and wanted also to, well, to influence uh, the, the readers in Germany or in the Western world uh, to have a special view on, on this situation. And I think um, Beit has a real um, anti-Russian view in this time. So it's not a reality, it's uh, somehow a kind of construction uh, of this time. Did I answer your question? Professor Ayush, Dr. Daniel Ayush. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Miller, for your presentation. My question has to do particularly regarding Solomon Schweiger, who also translated the Quran for the first time to German as well. And uh, he also mentions that people were praying in Arabic, uh, the Christians were praying in the churches in Arabic. Um, some travelers, they had the conclusion that uh, uh, Christians were a fertile land for evangelization because uh, they were too much influenced by Islam. Was there in Schweiger this uh, approach or in other travelers, did they really have deductions also that they were a fertile land to be again evangelized because they were forgetting, forgetting Christianity? Yeah, well, uh, me as a German Protestant, I'm a little bit ashamed uh, concerning your question. I think that was the perspective. Um, well, uh, they, uh, the, the, the travelers like uh, Salomon Schweiger, they thought that it's a country under um, Islamic oppression. 
and that it's a country where there isn't any education anymore. That's uh, well, everybody mentions in this time that the Iraqs, um, the the priests are not educated at all, and they have to be educated. And well, the thinking of this Western people uh, was if they began to read, if they began to to study, they uh, will be. Um, well, they, 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 they will be proselytes to, to Protestantism or to, to at least uh, to Western culture. Um, it's uh, somehow uh, a kind of thinking which, uh, well, all the, the early modern times was very uh, present. Um, this, uh, well, I, I said this arrogant view on, on, on the, the, um, uh, the Oriental uh, population. I think somehow it's still the same today, but uh, uh, it, it was a very arrogant uh, kind of thinking. And that's why they were bringing a lot of books. For example, uh, I, I found books in, in Sinai Monastery, uh, books uh, from the Reformation. They, they bring, brought a lot of books to, to educate this poor people under uh, the Ottoman oppression. That, that, that was their, their kind of thinking. And uh, well, they, they knew that there were Christians, but they thought that these Christians lost their tradition um, because they they are uneducated, and I'm as I, I, I began, uh, I'm really ashamed that uh, this was the perspective of the, the Western people. And you know that there were also some kind of uh, dialogues. Uh, there, there were professors like Martin Crusius uh, in Tübingen who knows a lot about who knew a lot about the the, the Eastern world, but he still believed that uh, well. Uh, the West has to uh, enlighten uh, the East, although <laughs> the light is coming from the East. I don't know if I answered your question, uh, but uh, well, I, they knew that there were Christians, but uh, they thought that they aren't real Christians. Yes. Uh, Father Jacques Khalil, Father Thank Dean. You. Thank you. Uh, Professor Muller, um, I found in your um, lecture, very interesting information. First, although this uh, presentation of the Orthodox uh, from Western people uh, was a little bit ironic and arrogant, uh, as you said, exactly. Uh, but uh, it's a fact that they validate indirectly the identity of the church. Mm. You describe how they uh, analyze the Orthodox faith and uh, the different patriarchates, the relationship between them. This is also a very positive input. Uh, and on the other hand, I would like, I, I, I'm a little bit confused by uh, the description, totally the totally negative description, uh, because we heard previously from Professor Valbiner also and others that uh, uh, the Patriarchate of Antioch was pretty much advanced in comparison with other patriarchates in following the newly published uh, books, the widely spread uh, uh, monographies, and they were eager to translate them and to print them. And these um, travelers from Germany, they came here uh, in the 17th, and 18th century where uh, this process was active and those dreams were realized. So how can we reconcile this totally negative information with another information about uh, educational activity, advanced educational activity? Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, dear Dean Aspectabilis. Well, I was also, or I'm always confused if I'm reading uh, texts concerning the East uh, in, the, in the, the modern times. Uh, and I think it was, uh, we, we have to, to read the sources on both sides. And we have to see that the Western sources, well, are somehow a kind of construction. They describe the East how they wanted to describe it. like fake news today. So um, 
yeah, they 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 wanted to to product uh, to to create a, uh, an icon of of Orthodox uh, population, which wasn't true, but which wasn't uh, which was helpful for their own purposes, for their own aims. That that's it. And I think if we are writing today a, a global church history, we always have to to compare the different sources: the the Arabic sources, the, the Ottoman sources, the, the Latin and the, the Greek sources. Uh, and we have to compare the, the different constructions of reality um, also in modern times. That's what I believe. And uh, I think that it was really a construction for, yeah, for, for well, uh, for, for the West and not a real icon of uh, the East, what they gave. Um, and it, in modern times, in our times, it's easier to, uh, well, to evaluate uh, fake news. But in these times, it was very difficult. Uh, Schweiger was the only one who described in such a good way, in such a, well, very differentiated way, uh, uh, the, the Eastern world. And um, there wa wasn't any other source in, in the Western world to, to, to compare to Schweiger. And um, as I mentioned, everybody, um, uh, we produced these stereotypes afterwards. Heineckius is mentioning Schweiger and he also uses the same stereotypes. And um, I think uh, it was only the uh, ecumenical movement and the direct context we have nowadays or to, to overcome this, this crazy fake news. Okay. Mr. Imad Rebais. Good evening. Thank you for this interesting lecture. I would want to raise the issue of Greek Orthodox and Rome Orthodox, the issue that Sayyidna uh, asked a little earlier to Dr. Hassan. Well, I just want to contribute stating the fact that uh, late father John Romanides has had a very interesting debate and writings about Romians, Rome, Romeo Sili, and Romelli to debate the fact that the actual faith of the Easterners, Orthodox in the East, has always been appraised by the Roman Empire, hence naming them Rome Orthodox. However, in the Middle Ages onward, we see that the naming has changed, particularly in the West, to designate and belittle the faith of the Easterners by naming, naming them Greek Orthodox to indicate that these are only the Greeks who have this uh, faith and the others who are more, Rome and others, well, have the right. Well, uh, do you have or have you ever read something in the travelers that passed here, the, the German travelers in the East, uh, anything that would debate this issue, their perspective, what they have witnessed here taking place in terms of this debate. Actually, this debate has been contradicted, counter-contradicted, counter-counter-counter-contradicted several times throughout history. But still the fact is, and it's surprising that in Lebanon, uh, well, for many years, well, if, since Lebanon existed till some 10 or 15 years ago, on our ID, we would have uh, the description as a sect called Rum Orthodox in Arabic, whereas on our passports and uh, foreign identities, they will mention Greek Orthodox or in French, Greek Orthodox. But still, it's Rome Orthodox. Mm. So why this insistence on belittling the Orthodox of the East who have held the true faith of the fathers since the beginning by insisting on naming them Greek Orthodox throughout? Uh, any answer, any debate well, that has happened in yeah. this sense? Thank you. I, I never found in, in the sources before the 20th century the name Rome Orthodox. And I just have an idea about well the the, the reasons um, after the times of uh, 
Carl the, 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 the Great. Um, the, the, for, for the Western people, uh, the real room uh, or the, the real follower of the Romans were the, the Western ones. Uh, it was, uh, our area was called the Holy Roman um, Empire. So, uh, well, it was a debate uh, of uh, who is the, the real follower. And uh, in the Western sources, you, you, you can't read uh, well about the, the people in the East uh, that they are, um, uh, that they are room. You can find the, the, the word uh, Greek and you can find uh, in, in the 19th century, the Hellenic uh, identity which is a little bit more problematically um, problematic, but there isn't any any idea of uh, room people or Romeo Sini uh, as uh, Romanides uh, mentioned. I think, uh, well, it, it's still this kind of, of, of thinking of the early medieval times, which uh, um, which was very strong also in the early modern times. Yes. So allow me before closing the session uh, to make a small uh, note on this issue of identity. Yes, definitely, Eastern Christians were called Byzantine for the first time by Charlemagne, the founder of the European, Western European kingdom. Uh, calling it Roman Western uh, Kingdom and calling the Eastern part of Christianity as Byzantine. Mm. Uh, usually to, to locate a people, to specify the identity of a people, we have to search in the archives of the nation itself, what does the nation cause itself in her official registers? So the so-called Byzantines in all their decrees, with no exception, call themselves Rome, Roman, and this is obvious, this is clear. There, and we also see what their enemies call them. So all Arab, all Arabs and all Arabic sources call the so-called Byzantines, they call them Rum. Rum, all literature against the Byzantines is called Rumiyat. The Persians also call them Rum and the Seljukis call them Rum, the Mamlukis call them Rum, only Western literature calls them Byzantine or yes, with the modern Balkanization, modern nationalism, the terminology Hellenic Greek became more reliable and more used. We have to close the, the session. I would like definitely, to, I'd like to thank Father Nassis and Professor Chulak for coming to Lebanon in these difficult times. I, I definitely thank Professor Muller for joining us, for being with us. Uh, thank you so much, dear friends. We close this session. Now we have a 30 min minutes break.